Good afternoon. Um, well, first, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's been 16 years since I've been here. Uh, time flies very quickly. Uh, but I'm very happy to be back. I'm very happy not only to see the city of Bodrum booming, but also seeing the size of the group expanding as uh, this is a great conference and I'm, I'm, I'm privileged to also contribute a, a little piece to it. Um, my talk today will be devoted to the issue of freedom in Europe. It will partially, hopefully, be similar to the story we've heard uh, yesterday about Switzerland in which we had freedom in the past, then some time in between when the statists gained power, and then, be it a dream or not, some future which might be again a future of, of free people living, not only in Switzerland, but hopefully in the whole of Europe. I'll be using an example of my country, Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia, where I was born as an example of a transition uh, between periods of freedom and unfreedom. Uh, I will use some of the greatest ideas of Austrian economists such as uh, Ludwig von Mises uh, to uh, explain the story. Um, also, I should mention at the very beginning that my speech is based on a ch chapter of, of a book which has just been released by Rutledge uh, called Transition Economies, uh, Austrian Perspective, which is an outcome of a conference organized something like two years ago, not, not even two years ago, by the Mises Institute of Poland, Wroclaw University, and the University of Alberta in Canada. All right. Um, as I said, I was born in Czechoslovakia, unfortunately, to the period of communism, which started there a few years after the Second, Second World War. Uh, as you may know, uh, in this part of the world, communists uh, typically, or at least in my country, they first became popular they won elections, so by pretty much democratic tools they got to power. In our case it was 1946, and then within two years they got complete control over the army and police forces and so on, and then once they got it they started misusing the power. So in the next 40 years they would kill thousands of people, they would imprison dozens of thousands of people, and they would force to leave the country uh, hundreds of thousands of people. A country which once was a kind of industrial powerhouse uh, over time due to central planning and political oppression got destroyed and became poor. At the beginning, so in the late 40s and maybe 50s, uh, a lot of people actually believed that socialism is doable. Uh, we know that these people were naive, uh, but well, many of them honestly believed. But over time, nobody could possibly believe that the system can produce something else other than poverty or oppression. So towards the end, in like the mid and late 80s, uh, nobody believed anything what was said on TV, nobody believed politicians, nobody believed in any noble ideas that possibly those politicians could deliver. So everybody knew that that's not the way or that's not what, what people wanted, uh, that the idea of socialism became discredited, 
Uh, some people saw just practical problems with it, and that was enough to see that the system is broken. But not many people knew you know, what to do about it, how to replace it with something more livable. And at that time, um, with the fall of the Berlin Wall, indeed, uh, in, so in November uh, 1989, a new generation of politicians got to power. And in our case, it was actually a unique generation of politicians. And this is exactly the place where uh, the ideas of Austrian school uh, played an important role in changing the system from centrally planned economy into a sort of market-based economy. You know, back then we had a uh, privatization minister who was a chief translator of F.A. Hayek's books. So still under communism, he would translate the road to serfdom or law, legislation, and liberty. So he, he knew what to do theoretically, and then by a chance of history, by, or by an accident of history, he became highly ranked in the political hierarchy, being responsible for privatization. Or another man who was the leading force of the reforms in early 90s, uh, first the finance minister, later on prime minister, and even later on the president of the country, he explicitly stated that he has learned economics uh, from Ludwig von Mises, and that he considers Mises to be the greatest economist of all time, which is interesting, right? You do not compare it to politicians in your own countries today, or in my country for that matter as well today, it has you know, nothing of the sort, you do not see nothing of the sort anymore. But back then, these people who knew at least some of the Austrian uh, approaches to you know, like policy making, they were in power. And hence, privatization happened. Before, everything was state-owned, uh, all land, all factories, everything under state control. So privatization was needed exactly as the Austrians argue, well, you have to have the system of private property, private property of the means of production, so that you then get markets that produce reasonable, meaningful prices, and these prices are telling us something about you know, what to do, how to find uh, a, a place in the division of labor which is needed for the economy to function, for the society to prosper. So that was done. Uh, restitution took place. Many things which had been stolen before by the communists returned or were returned to original owners. Uh, it, it, so uh, it played both the role of reintroduction of private property, and at the same time, it played the role of reintroducing justice to the system. Indeed, unfortunately, uh, it was not perfect. Only some of the restitution uh, took place, so it, it didn't go before uh, communists took power, uh, despite the fact that still under the democratic regime before communism, a lot of nationalization happened. All banks got nationalized, big industry and so on. But, you know, better uh, res restitute at least something uh, and actually send a sort of sound message that, you know, we are here now building a society based on private property. Um, there was a little complication in the transition process, uh, pretty much exactly as Ludwig von Mises predicted when you read his book, Nation, State, and Economy, he says, well, in multi-ethnic uh, societies, uh, 
you, sh you should not rather centralize because centralization typically means imposing the will of majority, meaning the, 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 the bigger group, linguistic or national group, on like smaller uh, groups, uh, on people speaking other or different languages or belonging to different uh, ethnic group. Um, so in multi-ethnic societies, decentralization should, place, should take place, uh, otherwise you create hostilities. Uh, well, exactly that happened uh, between Czechs and Slovaks, where Slovaks believed that most of the problems they have to face or cope with uh, are not their own problems, that these are problems caused by the evil Czechs, and hence uh, they're, they're, they wanted to separate, to secede from the Federation, Czechoslovak Federation. And as many of you know, it was actually a very peaceful divorce, a very peaceful secession, exactly what we would expect uh, in terms of results of such a step, that whereas before there were problems, and your first excuse always was, but well, the other guys are responsible for it. Once the secession happened, you didn't have that easy excuse. And hence, uh, relations, relations between the two countries dramatically improved and are great uh, till that moment uh, until now. So, uh, indeed, negotiation and debate about how exactly to do it took some time, but uh, then it happened. A political deal was made and the country peacefully split uh, and as I said, it dramatically improved the uh, relationships. Indeed, as a part of transition toward uh, a market society, uh, sort of political, foreign political inv involvement, in our case, presence of Russian soldiers or Soviet Russians had to be solved as well. And here, once again, a deal was made that they sort of peacefully left the country, uh, leaving behind destroyed military bases and a lot of environmental damage and all the rest of it. But they, they went home after almost 30 years of being there and so far have not returned. Um, indeed, practical policy making and economic and social development is not easy. But now after 30 years, after the fall of communism in my country, we actually can see a big picture of a successful economic transition. And yes, it lasted 10 years before banks got privatized. And indeed, you know, state is still too big, uh, redistribution is over 40% and so on and so forth. But when you see how different the country looks like, how different the cities look looks like, how once an impoverished country is actually now a prosperous place, uh, you know, that looks like a successful story or a success story of economic transition. Um, in terms of GDP per capita, for example, Czech Republic is now richer than Spain, is roughly at the same level as Italy is. Right? In terms of economic freedom, uh, Czech Republic is number 17 uh, by the Fraser Institute uh, Index of Economic Freedom. So, again, could be better, I can imagine, you know, number two is better, or number one is better than 17, and I know that people from countries who ranked higher still complain that the state is too big and economic freedom still has to be fought for. Yes, I know that, but, you know, given that 30 years ago everything was state-owned and we all lived with all the consequences of economic and political oppression, we have a success story here. 
Now, this is not the end of my talk here. Uh, there is indeed a problem or a potential problem which appeared in the meantime, namely that the process of rediscovering markets, uh, the process of privatization, and so on and so forth, got complicated by the fact that the European Union uh, emerged, was put together, and new and new centralization tendencies take place at the same time. Uh, which uh, for some of us was indeed a danger as the great reform ethos of 1990s over time was replaced by adoption of all sorts of you know, bureaucratic uh, measures uh, imported to the country from the European Union. Um, I myself actively uh, resisted that. I wrote articles against EU accession. As a footnote, I, I even managed to publish an article called Down with the EU in the Czech version of the Playboy magazine so that you could see naked girls and next to it an article that quoted Hans Hoppe and Ludwig von Mises. Um, but didn't really you know, change the uh, the forces of history, um, and here we are, as the Czech Republic and other countries, members of the European Union, and the big question is, you know, what to do about it. Now, as, as always, um, it's useful to take a look at uh, the works of Ludwig von Mises, um, and maybe surprisingly for many, it, the story doesn't necessarily have to be too pessimistic here. Now why? Um, back in the 30s, Ludwig von Mises could witness the breakdown of the European liberal order. He could see all sorts of nationalists being in power, uh, using national or misusing nationalistic sentiments, in turning them into nationalistically oriented policies that targeted like neighboring countries or sometimes targeted people within the country, uh, simply there was a huge wave of um, economic nationalism, politics uh, that uh, rather than uh, supporting or creating social harmony as markets do, uh, brought about a lot of interventionism and a lot of you know, problems and hatred and conflicts and and everything which uh, is not compatible with a peaceful, classical, liberal social order. And Mises back then, as he indeed still believed that you know, markets are the solution, decentralization is the solution, suddenly saw that that's not what we are getting. And nobody was listening to him or other classical liberals. Uh, and so as a desperate attempt to save Europe, maybe, he, he wrote an article in which he suggested introduction of what, is, what he called Eastern European Democratic Union, an attempt to create some kind of classical liberal framework, almost like a, a constitution that would impose classical liberal order from above and prevent nationalistic policies to be used and misused. So suddenly we, we are having this great libertarian who always argued decentralization, actually argued centralization in the name of maybe last possible attempt to, to you know, save Europe from nationalists of, and socialists of all sorts. 
And what is interesting here is that he said, because he was knowledgeable of the dynamics of interventionism, so then he said, okay, well, it's not enough to say you cannot use like state schools against minorities or whatever, because that could be cir circumvented uh, smartly by, you know, like manipulating uh, building codes, uh, construction codes, so that, you know, y you would not allow schools to be built and hence education for minorities to happen. And so, so Mises surprisingly came up with actually a very centralized, or idea of a very centralized system which then should serve as a protection against nationalistic sentiments and nationalistically driven policies. Indeed, he knew and explicitly mentioned that there is no chance how uh, such a plan could be introduced, let's say, in Europe in 1930s or something like that. Um, but, well, wrote it anyway. and. Um, elaborated on an idea how uh, yeah, prevent nationalism from spreading by centralization rather than decentralization. Now, um, back to the story, Europe today, Czech Republic as a member of the European Union, what should libertarians do vis-a-vis -vis European Union? Um, indeed, the uh, current European Union is not a classical liberal paradise. You can't meet anybody who would be free market leaning uh, politicians when you visit Brussels or other places. So the, the, the institution is full of statists, full of people who want to build something else that what, what we want. But still, um, you could find uh, works, papers, even books, by people who appreciate liberty, who are advocates of uh, the Austrian School of Economics, who are libertarians, um, who actually say all right, similar things that what, what Mises was arguing for. Um, an, an example of it would be um, one of the greatest Austrians in Europe, uh, Professor Jesus Huerta de Soto in Spain, a decade ago, he wrote a, an article uh, uh, named uh, a, an Austrian defense of the euro. Right? And now you, you may say, okay, well, that's weird because we know the guy, he, he, he is in favor of the gold standard and so on. He understands that there has to be separation of state and money. Uh, but once you start thinking about the argument, well, then it's um, perhaps similar to how Mises thought about these things. Like, all right, well, you know, option number one, decentralization or denationalized money or something, that, that's not available at the moment. So we have either nationalists running the printing presses on national level, so like Spanish central bank printing, you know, pesetas, uh, which they have a great history of, uh, or you may have European uh, bankers, central bankers, who maybe are not necessarily worse than the national ones. It, it's a, an open question. These are, uh, in both cases, central banks are institutions which are not really compatible with with like, you know, free market order. But it's an empirical question, which ones will misuse the printing presses more? And De Soto argued that Euro in a way is almost like a, you know, the gold standard because it prevents local nationalistic politicians to misuse monetary policy. It took some powers from one level of governance and shifted it upward. Now, indeed, the, que the question is, shall we, for some reason, like more like the gang leaders that speak the same language as we do, more than those who do not speak the same language? Or 
uh, is there some interesting interplay between now those two new institutions, meaning, uh, or one new institution, there is the European level of governance or policy making and uh, national level, which in a way balances out each other somehow, right? So once we realize that we do not live in the, in the world of um, you know, best options only, we are talking here second best, trying to understand that with the European Union in existence, we might perhaps witness some of the effects which Mises wanted the, his sort of European Union quote unquote to perform, uh, maybe we can see it somehow. Maybe due to the existence of that level of political decision making, some of the worst nationalist policies would not be able to take place. We can't answer that, I believe, theoretically, but we have some experience and we will have experience in the future to actually see whether that is true or not. Because indeed, nationalists or socialists will be running both of those institutions. Uh, and indeed the centralization tendencies, they take a long time, right? We've, we've, we've seen it in the US how, how it started with a, you know, a simple constitution uh, a limited government and over time what, what has been happening. So something of that sort indeed has been happening and will be happening in Europe as well. Uh, the question is whether perhaps there are some uh, countervailing forces which might or might not bring some sort of equilibrium uh, in which uh, the centralization might or could possibly be stopped. Now, some people argue that here um, the nationalism, which Mises was so much afraid of, can actually play a, a useful role in the following sense. Uh, indeed, most of uh, politicians, most of interventionists and socialists of all kinds would want to centralize as much as possible to get control over, over us. But in Europe, with still existing nation, nation states, uh, it seems impossible, or it, at least it's complicated, to, to centralize quickly and fully. Uh, because that goes against those nationalistic sentiments. So, you know, French would never agree on something which, you know, somebody else uh, suggests. So there might be limits to what could be done. And the idea of ever closer union sounds for them good on paper, but it's more and more difficult to, to materialize it, especially when the, Europe, the membership of the European Union is going up, is growing. So we see it today that, there is, that to, to agree on something is actually very complicated. And that very often what we see is that uh, some states try to navigate or to look for unorthodox solutions uh, which are not necessarily in the original framework of the European architecture, right? Uh, let's say the Schengen Agreement. So it's, it's, it's only some people, or not people, some countries, some states that participate. Uh, so because larger agreement is not feasible today. So now the optimist could possibly argue that um, higher costs of closer and closer uh, or bigger and bigger centralization, closer and closer union, prevent centralization from deepening 
Um, and at the same time, there will be uh, these ad hoc alliances of states to address some problems, which looks or may look like, uh, you know, uh, what we in economics know under the name of theory of clubs. So, you know, ad hoc kind of coalitions. Or maybe it could lead to an idea which uh, some Swiss economists um, are famous for, such as this Bruno Leone, a public choice Swiss economist, who came up with the idea of uh, functional overlapping competing jurisdictions. So, um, yes, we see the process happening in Europe under the umbrella of the European Union. Yes, that's all true. We don't know what the result will be, but I'm hoping that for the reasons I try to explain, namely existing nationalistic sentiments and hence national states that do not want to fully uh, transfer power to the European level, we may end up in a world of some kind of polycentric club-like uh, operation, which might then actually uh, sort of uh, bring into existence the Mise old Misesian ideas that even f uh, that by setting some rules of state coexistence, we might uh, end up living in a in Europe which will be far from classical liberal or libertarian ideal, but will not necessarily be a sort of totalitarian, fully centralized hell. And hence, the quality of life and standard of living could, the same way as I documented on the numbers from the Czech Republic over the last 30 years, could continue in a sort of similar way uh, in the future decades. So I'm not sure whether the story is an optimistic one, but at least I guess there is still hope. Thank you very much.